Chapter 3.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Biddy The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 3.2 Adaptation and Non-Adaptation in the Law Enforcement Community Legal processes were the primary method for responding to these early manifestations of a new type of terrorism. Our overview of U.S. capabilities for dealing with it thus begins with the nation's vast complex of law enforcement agencies. The Justice Department and the FBI At the federal level, much law enforcement activity is concentrated in the Department of Justice. For countering terrorism, the dominant agency under justice is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The FBI does not have a general grant of authority, but instead works under specific statutory authorizations. Most of its work is done in local offices, called field offices. There are 56 of them, each covering a specified geographic area, and each quite separate from all others. Prior to 9-11, the special agent in charge was in general free to set his or her office's priorities and assign personnel accordingly. The office's priorities were driven by two primary concerns. First, performance in the Bureau was generally measured against statistics such as numbers of arrests, indictments, prosecutions and convictions. Counterterrorism and counterintelligence work often involving lengthy intelligence investigations that might never have positive or quantifiable results was not career-enhancing. Most agents who reached management ranks had little counterterrorism experience. Second, priorities were driven at the local level by the field officers, whose concerns centered on traditional crimes such as white-collar offenses and those pertaining to drugs and gangs. Individual field officers made choices to serve local priorities, not national priorities. The Bureau also operates under an Office of Origin system. To avoid duplication and possible conflicts, the FBI designates a single office to be in charge of an entire investigation. Because the New York field office indicted bin Laden prior to the East Africa bombings, it became the Office of Origin for all bin Laden cases including the East Africa bombings and later the attack on the USS Coal. Most of the FBI's institutional knowledge on bin Laden and Al-Qaeda resided there. This office worked closely with the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York to identify, arrest, prosecute and convict many of the perpetrators of the attacks and plots. Field offices, other than the specified office of origin, were often reluctant to spend much energy on matters over which they had no control and for which they received no credit. The FBI's domestic intelligence gathering dates from the 1930s. With World War II looming, President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to investigate foreign and foreign-inspired subversion, communist, Nazi, and Japanese. Hoover added investigation of possible espionage, sabotage, or subversion to the duties of field offices. After the war, foreign intelligence duties were assigned to the newly established Central Intelligence Agency. Hoover jealously guarded the FBI's domestic portfolio against all rivals. Hoover felt he was accountable only to the President, and the FBI's domestic intelligence activities kept growing. In the 1960s, the FBI was receiving significant assistance within the United States from the CIA and from Army Intelligence. The legal basis for some of this assistance was dubious. Decades of encouragement to perform as a domestic intelligence agency abruptly ended in the 1970s. Two years after Hoover's death in 1972, congressional and news media investigations of the Watergate scandals of the Nixon administration expanded into general investigations of foreign and domestic intelligence by the Church and Pike Committees. They disclosed domestic intelligence efforts, which included a covert action program that operated from 1956 to 1971 against domestic organizations and eventually domestic dissidents. 
the FBI had spied on a wide range of political figures, especially individuals whom Hoover wanted to discredit, notably the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., and had authorized unlawful wiretaps and surveillance. The shock registered in public opinion polls, where the percentage of Americans declaring a highly favorable view of the FBI dropped from 84 percent to 37 percent. The FBI's Domestic Intelligence Division was dissolved. In 1976, Attorney General Edward Levi adopted domestic security guidelines to regulate intelligence collection in the United States and to deflect calls for even stronger regulation. In 1983, Attorney General William French Smith revised the Levi guidelines to encourage closer investigation of potential terrorism. He also loosened the rules governing authorization for investigations and their duration. Still, his guidelines, like Levi's, took account of the reality that suspicion of terrorism, like suspicion of subversion, could lead to making individuals targets for investigation more because of their beliefs than because of their acts. Smith's guidelines also took account of the reality that potential terrorists were often members of extremist religious organizations and that investigation of terrorism could cross the line separating state and church. In 1986, Congress authorized the FBI to investigate terrorist attacks against Americans that occur outside the United States. Three years later, it added authority for the FBI to make arrests abroad without consent from the host country. Meanwhile, a task force headed by Vice President George H. W. Bush had endorsed a concept already urged by Director of Central Intelligence William Casey, a counter-terrorist center, where the FBI, the CIA, and other organizations could work together on international terrorism. While it was distinctly a CIA entity, the FBI detailed officials to work at the center and obtained leads that helped in the capture of persons wanted for trial in the United States. The strengths that the FBI brought to counterterrorism were nowhere more brilliantly on display than in the case of Pan American Flight 103, bound from London to New York, which blew up over Lockerbie, Scotland, in December 1988, killing 270 people. Initial evidence pointed to the government of Syria, and later Iran. The counterterrorist center reserved judgment on the perpetrators of the attack. Meanwhile, FBI technicians working with UK security services gathered and analyzed the widely scattered fragments of the airliner. In 1991, with the help of the Counter-Terrorist Center, they identified one small fragment as part of a timing device, to the technicians as distinctive as DNA. It was a Libyan device. Together with other evidence, the FBI put together a case pointing conclusively to the Libyan government. Eventually, Libya acknowledged its responsibility. Pan Am 103 became a cautionary tale against rushing to judgment in attributing responsibility for a terrorist act. It also showed again how, given a case to solve, the FBI remained capable of extraordinary investigative success. FBI Organization and Priorities in 1993, President Clinton chose Louis Free as the director of the Bureau. Free, who would remain director until June 2001, believed that the FBI's work should be done primarily by the field offices. To emphasize this view, he cut headquarters staff and decentralized operations. The special agents in charge gained power, influence, and independence. Free recognized terrorism as a major threat. He increased the number of legal attaché offices abroad, focusing in particular on the Middle East. He also urged agents not to wait for terrorist acts to occur before taking action. In his first budget request to Congress after the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, he stated that merely solving this type of crime is not enough. It is equally important that the FBI thwart terrorism before such acts can be perpetrated. Within headquarters, he created a counterterrorism division that would complement the counterterrorist center at the CIA and arranged for exchanges of senior FBI and CIA counterterrorism officials. He pressed for more cooperation between legal attaches and CIA stations abroad. 
Free's efforts did not, however, translate into a significant shift of resources to counterterrorism. FBI, Justice, and Office of Management and Budget officials said that FBI leadership seemed unwilling to shift resources to terrorism from other areas, such as violent crime and drug enforcement. Other FBI officials blamed Congress and the OMB for a lack of political will and failure to understand the FBI's counterterrorism resource needs. In addition, Free did not impose his views on the field offices. With a few notable exceptions, the field offices did not apply significant resources to terrorism and often reprogrammed funds for other priorities. In 1998, the FBI issued a five-year strategic plan led by its deputy director, Robert Bear Bryant. For the first time, the FBI designated national and economic security, including counterterrorism, as its top priority. Dale Watson, who would later become the head of the new counterterrorism division, said that after the East Africa bombings, the light came on that cultural change had to occur within the FBI. The plan mandated a stronger intelligence collection effort. It called for a nationwide automated system to facilitate information collection, analysis, and dissemination. It envisioned the creation of a professional intelligence cadre of experienced and trained agents and analysts. If successfully implemented, this would have been a major step toward addressing terrorism systematically, rather than as individual unrelated cases. But the plan did not succeed. First, the plan did not obtain the necessary human resources. Despite designating national and economic security as its top priority in 1998, the FBI did not shift human resources accordingly. Although the FBI's counterterrorism budget tripled during the mid-1990s, FBI counterterrorism spending remained fairly constant between fiscal years 1998 and 2001. In 2000, there were still twice as many agents devoted to drug enforcement as to counterterrorism. Second, the new division intended to strengthen the FBI's strategic analysis capability faltered. It received insufficient resources and faced resistance from senior managers in the FBI's operational divisions. The new division was supposed to identify trends in terrorist activity, determine what the FBI did not know, and ultimately drive collection efforts. However, the FBI had little appreciation for the role of analysis. Analysts continued to be used primarily in a tactical fashion, providing support for existing cases. Compounding the problem was the FBI's tradition of hiring analysts from within, instead of recruiting individuals with the relevant educational background and expertise. Moreover, analysts had difficulty getting access to the FBI and intelligence community information they were expected to analyze. The poor state of the FBI's information systems meant that such access depended in large part on an analyst's personal relationships with individuals in the operational units or squads where the information resided. For all of these reasons, prior to 9-11, relatively few strategic analytic reports about counterterrorism had been completed. Indeed, the FBI had never completed an assessment of the overall terrorist threat to the U.S. homeland. Third, the FBI did not have an effective intelligence collection effort. Collection of intelligence from human sources was limited, and agents were inadequately trained. Only three days of a 16-week agents course were devoted to counterintelligence and counterterrorism, and most subsequent training was received on the job. The FBI did not have an adequate mechanism for validating source reporting nor did it have a system for adequately tracking and sharing source reporting, either internally or externally. The FBI did not dedicate sufficient resources to the surveillance and translation needs of counterterrorism agents. It lacked sufficient translators, proficient in Arabic and other key languages, resulting in a significant backlog of untranslated intercepts. Finally, the FBI's information systems were woefully inadequate. The FBI lacked the ability to know what it knew. There was no effective mechanism for capturing or sharing its institutional knowledge. FBI agents did create records of interviews and other investigative efforts, but there were no reports officers 
to condense the information into meaningful intelligence that could be retrieved and disseminated. In 1999, the FBI created separate counterterrorism and counterintelligence divisions. Dale Watson, the first head of the new counterterrorism division, recognized the urgent need to increase the FBI's counterterrorism capability. His plan, called MaxCap 05, was unveiled in 2000. It set the goal of bringing the Bureau to its maximum feasible capacity in counterterrorism by 2005. Field executives told Watson that they did not have the analysts, linguists, or technically trained experts to carry out the strategy. In a report provided to Director Robert Mueller in September 2001, one year after Watson presented his plan to field executives, almost every FBI field office was assessed to be operating below maximum capacity. The report stated that the goal to prevent terrorism requires a dramatic shift in emphasis from a reactive capability to highly functioning intelligence capability which provides not only leads and operational support but clear strategic analysis and direction. Legal Constraints on the FBI and the Wall The FBI had different tools for law enforcement and intelligence. For criminal matters it could apply for and use traditional criminal warrants. For intelligence matters involving international terrorism, however, the rules were different. For many years, the Attorney General could authorize surveillance of foreign powers and agents of foreign powers without any court review. But in 1978, Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. This law regulated intelligence collection directed at foreign powers and agents of foreign powers in the United States. In addition to requiring court review of proposed surveillance and later physical searches, the 1978 Act was interpreted by the courts to require that a search be approved only if its primary purpose was to obtain foreign intelligence information. In other words, the authorities of the FISA law could not be used to circumvent traditional criminal warrant requirements. The Justice Department interpreted these rulings as saying that criminal prosecutors could be briefed on FISA information but could not direct or control its collection. Throughout the 1980s and early 1990s, justice prosecutors had informal arrangements for obtaining information gathered in the FISA process, the understanding being that they would not improperly exploit that process for their criminal cases. Whether the FBI shared with prosecutors information pertinent to possible criminal investigations was left solely to the judgment of the FBI. But the prosecution of Aldrich Ames for espionage in 1994 revived concerns about the prosecutor's role in intelligence investigations. The Department of Justice's Office of Intelligence Policy and Review, OIPR, is responsible for reviewing and presenting all FISA applications to the FISA court. It worried that because of the numerous prior consultations between FBI agents and prosecutors, the judge might rule that the FISA warrants had been misused. If that had happened, Ames might have escaped conviction. Richard Scruggs, the acting head of OIPR, complained to Attorney General Janet Reno about the lack of information sharing controls. On his own, he began imposing information sharing procedures for FISA material. The Office of Intelligence Policy and Review became the gatekeeper for the flow of FISA information to criminal prosecutors. In July 1995, Attorney General Reno issued formal procedures aimed at managing information sharing between Justice Department prosecutors and the FBI. They were developed in a working group led by the Justice Department's Executive Office of National Security, overseen by Deputy Attorney General Jamie Gorlick. These procedures, while requiring the sharing of intelligence information with prosecutors, regulated the manner in which such information could be shared from the intelligence side of the House to the criminal side. These procedures were almost immediately misunderstood and misapplied. As a result, there was far less information sharing and coordination between the FBI and the criminal division in practice than was allowed under the department's procedures. Over time, the procedures came to be referred to as the wall. The term the wall is misleading, however, because several factors led to a series of barriers to information sharing that developed. 
the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review, became the sole gatekeeper for passing information to the criminal division. Though Attorney General Reno's procedures did not include such a provision, the office assumed the role anyway, arguing that its position reflected the concerns of Judge Royce Lambert, then Chief Judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. The office threatened that if it could not regulate the flow of information to criminal prosecutors, it would no longer present the FBI's warrant request to the FISA court. The information flow withered. The 1995 procedures dealt only with sharing between agents and criminal prosecutors, not between two kinds of FBI agents, those working on intelligence matters and those working on criminal matters. But pressure from the Office of Intelligence Policy Review, FBI leadership and the FISA court built barriers between agents even agents serving on the same squads. FBI Deputy Director Bryant reinforced the office's caution by informing agents that too much information sharing could be a career stopper. Agents in the field began to believe incorrectly that no visa information could be shared with agents working on criminal investigations. This perception evolved into the still more exaggerated belief that the FBI could not share any intelligence information with criminal investigators, even if no visa procedures had been used. Thus, relevant information from the National Security Agency and the CIA often failed to make its way to criminal investigators. Separate reviews in 1999 2000 and 2001 concluded independently that information sharing was not occurring and that the intent of the 1995 procedures was ignored routinely. We will describe some of the unfortunate consequences of these accumulated institutional beliefs and practices in Chapter 8. There were other legal limitations. Both prosecutors and FBI agents argued that they were barred by court rules from sharing grand jury information, even though the prohibition applied only to that small fraction that had been presented to a grand jury, and even that prohibition had exceptions. But as interpreted by FBI field offices, this prohibition could conceivably apply to much of the information unearthed in an investigation. There were also restrictions arising from executive order on the commingling of domestic information with foreign intelligence. Finally, the NSA began putting caveats on its Bin Laden-related reports that required prior approval before sharing their contents with criminal investigators and prosecutors. These developments further blocked the arteries of information sharing. Other Law Enforcement Agencies The Justice Department is much more than the FBI. It also has a U.S. Marshals Service, almost 4,000 strong on 9-11, and especially expert in tracking fugitives with much local police knowledge. The department's Drug Enforcement Administration had, as of 2001, more than 4,500 agents. There were a number of occasions when DEA agents were able to introduce sources to the FBI or CIA for counterterrorism use. The Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, with its 9,000 Border Patrol agents, 4,500 inspectors and 2,000 immigration special agents had perhaps the greatest potential to develop an expanded role in counterterrorism. However, the INS was focused on the formidable challenges posed by illegal entry over the southwest border, criminal aliens, and a growing backlog in the applications for naturalizing immigrants. The White House, the Justice Department, and above all, the Congress reinforced these concerns. In addition, when Doris Meissner became INS Commissioner in 1993, she found an agency seriously hampered by outdated technology and insufficient human resources. Border Patrol agents were still using manual typewriters. Inspectors at ports of entry were using a paper watch list. The asylum and other benefits system did not effectively deter fraudulent applicants. Commissioner Meissner responded in 1993 to the World Trade Center bombing by providing seed money to the State Department's Consular Affairs Bureau to automate its terrorist watch list, used by consular officers and border inspectors. The INS assigned an individual in a new lookout unit 
to work with the State Department in watchlisting suspected terrorists and with the intelligence community and the FBI in determining how to deal with them when they appeared at ports of entry. By 1998, 97 suspected terrorists had been denied admission at U.S. ports of entry because of the watchlist. How to conduct deportation cases against aliens who were suspected terrorists caused significant debate. The INS had immigration law expertise and authority to bring the cases, but the FBI possessed the classified information sometimes needed as evidence, and information-sharing conflicts resulted. New laws in 1996 authorized the use of classified evidence in removal hearings, but the INS removed only a handful of the aliens with links to terrorist activity non-identified as associated with Al-Qaeda using classified evidence. Mid-level INS employees proposed comprehensive counterterrorism proposals to management in 1986, 1995 and 1997. No action was taken on them. In 1997, a National Security Unit was set up to handle alerts, track potential terrorist cases for possible immigration enforcement action, and work with the rest of the Justice Department. It focused on the FBI's priorities of Hezbollah and Hamas, and began to examine how immigration laws could be brought to bear on terrorism. For instance, it sought unsuccessfully to require that CIA security checks be completed before naturalization applications were approved. Policy questions, such as whether resident alien status should be revoked upon the person's conviction of a terrorist crime, were not addressed. Congress, with the support of the Clinton administration, doubled the number of Border Patrol agents required along the border with Mexico to one agent every quarter mile by 1999. It rejected efforts to bring additional resources to bear in the north. The border with Canada had one agent for every 13.25 miles. Despite examples of terrorists entering from Canada, awareness of terrorist activity in Canada and its more lenient immigration laws, and an Inspector General's report recommending that the Border Patrol develop a northern border strategy, the only positive step was that the number of Border Patrol agents was not cut any further. Inspectors at the ports of entry were not asked to focus on terrorists. Inspectors told us, they were not even aware when they checked the names of the incoming passengers against the automated watch list they were checking in part for terrorists. In general, border inspectors also did not have the information they needed to make fact-based determinations of admissibility. The INS initiated but failed to bring to completion two efforts that would have provided inspectors with information relevant to counterterrorism. A proposed system to track foreign student visa compliance and a program to establish a way of tracking travelers' entry to and exit from the United States. In 1996, a new law enabled the INS to enter into agreements with state and local law enforcement agencies through which the INS provided training and the local agencies exercised immigration enforcement authority. Terrorist watch lists were not available to them. Mayors in cities with large immigrant populations sometimes imposed limits on city employee cooperation with federal immigration agents. A large population lives outside the legal framework. Fraudulent documents could be easily obtained. Congress kept the number of INS agents static in the face of the overwhelming problem. The chief vehicle for INS and for state and local participation in law enforcement was the Joint Terrorism Task Force. JTTF, first tried out in New York City in 1980 in response to a spate of incidents involving domestic terrorist organizations. This task force was managed by the New York field office of the FBI, and its existence provided an opportunity to exchange information and, as happened after the first World Trade Center bombing, to enlist local officers, as well as other agency representatives, as partners in the FBI investigation. The FBI expanded the number of JTTFs throughout the 1990s, and by 9-11 there were 34. While useful, the JTTFs had limitations. They set low priorities in accordance with regional and field office concerns, and most were not fully staffed. Many state and local entities believed they had little to gain from having a full-time representative on a JTTF. 
other federal law enforcement resources, also not seriously enlisted for counterterrorism, were to be found in the Treasury Department. Treasury housed the Secret Service, the Customs Service, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Given the Secret Service's mission to protect the President and other high officials, its agents did become involved with those of the FBI whenever terrorist assassination plots were rumored. The Customs Service deployed agents at all points of entry into the United States. Its agents worked alongside INS agents, and the two groups sometimes cooperated. In the winter of 1999-2000, as will be detailed in Chapter 6, questioning by an especially alert customs inspector led to the arrest of an Al-Qaeda terrorist whose apparent mission was to bomb Los Angeles International Airport. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms was used on occasion by the FBI as a resource. The ATF's laboratories and analysis were critical to the investigation of the February 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center and the April 1995 bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Before 9-11, with the exception of one portion of the FBI, very little of the sprawling U.S. law enforcement community was engaged in countering terrorism. Moreover, law enforcement could be effective only after specific individuals were identified, a plot had formed, or an attack had already occurred. Responsible individuals had to be located, apprehended, and transported back to a U.S. court for prosecution. As FBI agents emphasized to us, the FBI and the Justice Department do not have cruise missiles. They declare war by indicting someone. They took on the lead role in addressing terrorism because they were asked to do so. End of chapter 3.2 Recording by Biddy